broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sherlyn Chen from Boringer Ingelheim, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar that is organized by the GastroPlus user group. Today's presentation is titled Discovery PPPK, How to Enhance the Expected Accuracy of Bioavailability Predictions for NCEs that are not primarily metabolized. This presentation will be given by two speakers, Dr. Eric Martin from Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research in Abramville, uh, California, and Dr. Michael Bolger from Simulations Plus Inc., Lancaster, uh, California. Dr. Michael Bolger is a chief scientist at Simulations Plus Inc. His formal education has been in biology, chemistry, pharmaceutical sciences, and pharmacology at UC San Diego and UC San Francisco. He was a professor of pharmaceutical sciences for 23 years at the University of Southern California School of Pharmacy and then retired from the USC in 2004. From 1987, to 1993, he was a co-founder and the director of medicinal chemistry at the Cosensus Inc. Dr. Bolger joined Simulations Plus Inc. in 1996. He programmed the first version of the software program called GastroPlus for simulation of mechanistic oral absorption and the physiologically, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetics in 1997. He currently works with a team of scientists, programmers at uh, Simulations Plus Inc. in the development of software programs for estimation of biopharmaceutical properties and simulations of absorption and bioavailability. He was elected to the rank of a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1996. In 2017, he was appointed to the NIH Scientific Advisory Com Committee on Alternative toxicolo uh, Toxicological Methods. Eric Martin has a PhD in Physical Organic Chemistry from Yale University. He has worked in computational drug design and herbicide design for, 20, uh, for 34 years at the Dow, Dow Elanco, Chiron, and Novartis. He's currently developing novel methodologies for two areas of drug discovery, building 5,300 experimental quality virtual screening models using profile QSAR, and the rational oral bioavailability design doing lead optimization by applying global sensitivity analysis to gastroplasty physiologically based pharmacokinetic simulations. Um, this webinar will be recorded and it will be available to the user uh, group members in the future. Follow, following the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You may either send your question using the questions pane on your control panel, or you may ask your question directly using the hand raising icon. If, you're using, if you are using a telephone to listen to the call, please be sure to enter the unique audio pin displayed when you join the call. This enables us to unmute your line so that we can hear you. So without further ado, we now begin the webinar presentation. Mike? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the introductions, Sherlyn, and thanks to the GastroPlus user group for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. Um, I met, uh, well, I, I met Eric many years ago, but uh, he came to me about four years ago with this concept of discovery um, use of PVPK. And uh, we started a collaboration uh, and um, worked with a, uh, a new postdoc that had come to uh, Novartis, uh, Pankaj Daga. And uh, I think it's been a, a fruitful collaboration. Um, today, we're going to start with just a quick introduction. I'm hoping to take no more than 10 minutes on the um, QSAR PVPK link for both in silico and um, in vitro, in vivo, um, extrapolation and bioavailability, uh, talk a little bit about um, the high throughput uh, pharmacokinetic module that's currently um, going to be in the uh, ADMET predictor um, version 9, and then how we can um, integrate the 
extended clearance classification system for uh, compounds in determining expected accuracy. And then Eric will go on with um, <clears throat> a novel method in discovery PBPK to um, enhance the accuracy of certain types of molecules and also uh, extend that into global sensitivity analysis for in medicinal chemistry. The This slide just gives a brief overview of a selected group of literature studies. The first four are related to uh, PBPK in discovery and, and one in clinical testing to uh, derive the uh, accuracy of predictions for full CP time, oral AUC, and uh, CMAX. And I just wanted to highlight the kind of accuracy that could be expected when you have uh, preclinical data and in vitro data in predicting AUC and CMAX. And you can see in 2005, one of the earliest studies, 48% um, within twofold for AUC, um, DeBuck and et al. 74% within twofold and 65% for CMAX. There was a study um, sponsored by the Pharma Institute um, that was initiated about 2008 and published in 2011 in a series of five papers. And they came up with 69% um, accuracy for within twofold for IV AUC, but only 21% for PO AUC. And the star represents the um, you know, fact that in that study, they did not use Gastro Plus or the uh, ACAP model. Uh, 2011, uh, Jones et al. at Pfizer did a pretty thorough study with 21 molecules. And uh, the accuracy in intravenous um, molecules was 80 to 90% for VDSS and clearance and 50% for POAUC and 67% for POCMAX. Then um, the published results from the initial Orbito project for PBPK prediction of CP time resulted in only 35% of the uh, POACs of more drugs than most of the other studies within twofold, but uh, about 65% uh, within twofold for bioavailability. The um, new program that we are uh, have initiated in uh, ADMET Predictor is the high throughput uh, pharmacokinetic simulation. And it's based on a full ACAT absorption model. It can predict the in silico percent absorbed and percent bioavailability for a given dose. Um, it, there's also a module called SimDose that would predict the dose required to achieve a target plasma concentration at steady state. So this is an iterative process where all the molecules in the database are optimized to find out what the relative dose would be to get to a target concentration. Both human and rat species are supported now, and uh, we can use either predicted or experimental um, physiological and uh, metabolic properties. The schematic of the HTPK simulation is shown here where we take the full ACAT model with the uh, lumen of the intestine, uh, estimation of the percent absorbed. We don't give, we don't worry about the um, gut uh, wall extraction at this point, but we do send it through the liver and then estimate the systemic clearance and first pass extraction by the liver and also the contribution of renal clearance based on fraction unbound and glomerular filtration. So if we look at the results on predicting oral bioavailability, one of the first um, tests that was put together by Michael Wallace was this <clears throat> 62 drug uh, database with molecules that were had primarily SIP metabolism as their clearance process. And we collected data for bioavailability from a variety of sources. The um, method was to estimate the physical chemical biopharmaceutical properties using ADMET predictor and also estimate these um, cytochrome P450s. If the molecule was a, predicted to be a substrate of that um, enzyme, the KM and Vmax values, and then run a 35-year-old American male PBPK simulation. The result first is shown here for fraction absorbed. And this is based on uh, 125 compounds that was published by Zhao in 2001. 
Um, Eighty-six percent of these were predicted to be within twofold of the observed, and uh, eighty percent were predicted to be within one point five fold. So this just indicates if the ACAT model is working uh, within this particular data set. The uh, bioavailability end of this um, for sixty-two drugs came up with seventy-three percent that were pre predicted to be within twofold of the observed bioavailability and 65 within 1.5 fold. So this was a hand selected data set that um, really optimized the chances for predicting this um, oral bioavailability. Now I wanna just introduce you to this extended clearance classification system. If you haven't heard about this, it was a um, initiative developed at Pfizer um, initiated by Monthina Varma and published with uh, Monthina Varma and uh, Amon El Katan um, in a couple of papers. This system is intended to predict the rate determining systemic clearance mechanism and divide it into that which would be based on metabolism, hepatic uptake, or renal clearance. The uh, physical chemical properties are fairly simple to do this classification. It's molecular weight, whether the molecule is an acid or a zwitter ion versus a base or a neutral. Uh, determination of high or low permeability based on a MDCK permeability assay that they have in-house that um, tries to, as much as possible, avoid the influence of uh, influx or efflux transporters. They applied it to 307 compounds and published the results where uh, single clearance mechanism was um, accounted for in about eight, 70 percent. The, they correctly predicted about 92 percent of the compounds using that system. This is a uh, confusion matrix showing on the left side the results obtained from uh, the Varma ECCS publications. If we follow the diagonal, these would be the ones that are predicted and observed to be accurate. And the ones on the off-diagonal elements are the number of molecules that were uh, incorrectly predicted. On the right side is a new uh, model that was developed at Simulations Plus. We call it the uh, Human Clearance Mechanism Model, and it's a binary classification initially for those three classes and then a combination of um, rules to add together the, uh, the outcome. And you can see, again, the diagonal represents the performance with uh, accurate predictions. In this table, we've got concordance, Yowden index, which is a balanced model of sensitivity and um, uh, specificity, and the uh, actual coverage that was available um, from the data sets that were used, the 307 compounds. Now, if we go to purely in silico prediction of bioavailability, that is not a hand-selected um, set of molecules, you can see that we have 187 drugs here um, with 74% within twofold. The take-home message from this is that the coloration is based on hepatic uptake using the uh, human uh, clearance mechanism model, metabolism and renal clearance. You see the great uh, discrepancy over here in the region of the hepatic uptake and also over here, which may be related to enterohepatic recirculation. Um, the majority of the ones that were classified as primarily cleared by metabolism or uh, renal clearance fall into the uh, uh, twofold zone. Moving on to um, oral bioavailability and discovery, this is one of the data sets that Eric is going to talk about. These were 49 uh, DT. PP4 inhibitors, and using the um, novel method he'll describe for local clearance, the um, prediction of oral bioavailability was much enhanced. But you can see this includes both ones that are primarily metabolized and also primarily cleared by renal clearance, predicted from that model, not necessarily uh, confirmed. And then finally, this um, plot of 81 11 beta hydroxy HSD inhibitors shows a different profile where the ones that were cleared primarily by metabolism that we might expect to be um, uh, more accurately predicted lie inside the uh, twofold zone, 
but the there's a whole bunch of ones that were predicted uh, to be cleared primarily by hepatic uptake, and these uh, generally contain um, you know a typical carboxylic acid. They're high molecular weight and uh, high permeability. Eric will talk more about those kind of results later, but you can see that instead of being over in this region, we actually with this new um, mechanism we'll talk about get good results. So in conclusion, um, I think the PBPK in discovery can be used uh, successfully in discovery. Uh, ECCS models help to identify the ones that uh, have potentially greater accuracy. The uh, purely in silico estimates of absorption and first pass extraction can be used to estimate bioavailability for compounds that are primarily metabolized. And among other topics, Eric would discuss this local clearance model. So I got to give acknowledgments to our HTPK team with uh, Robert and David and uh, Bob Clark and Marvin Waldman, Michael Wallace, Pankaj Daga, and um, Al Alexandra Miklos. There are several data sets in here, um, and these slides will be available for you to uh, discuss. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric Martin, who will um, give you the uh, whole story of that development. Uh, over the last four or five years. Thank you. Hi, so can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Well, I really appreciate this opportunity to tell you about the work that I and my coworkers have done in what we're calling rational bioavailability design. Uh, where we're optimizing bioavailability during lead optimization by applying global sensitivity analysis to physiologically based PK, PK calculations. Uh, Mike already mentioned Pankaj Daga, my former postdoc who now works with him at Simulations Plus. Uh, ben Made is a post, current postdoc with me and Mike is a collaborator and was also the external mentor for both of these, uh, for both of these postdocs. And the slide's not advancing. There we go. Uh, and the problem we're addressing is that when medicinal chemists try to optimize bioavailability, they use their experience or rules of thumb to modify compound properties. I've listed a few in this box here that are, are known to affect bioavailability. But bioavailability is a complex linear process, and the difficulty of optimizing multi-parameter uh, problems grows exponentially with the number of, of parameters. And furthermore, strategies can be in conflict. For example, uh, you might try to improve the solubility by adding a, a very polar or, or charged group, but then that can decrease the permeability, which would work uh, against bioavailability. Uh, so it would be really helpful to the medicinal chemists to be able to tell them which problem properties are the most influential for their particular lead optimization series. And finally, because this is a being used to decide what compounds to synthesize next, uh, all of the inputs to the program have to be computational. And so that immediately rules out uh, allometric scaling or compartmental PK modeling because those are really ways of analyzing existing animal data. In principle, you could try to develop a QSAR on the bioavailability for your lead series, uh, but a purely empirical model requires so many experimental data points to parameterize it that you're never going to have that much rat data during uh, lead optimization. And so that's why we've turned to physiologically based pharmacokinetics models. Uh, now, I'm guessing that most of you are probably using gastro plus calculations on a fairly small number of very advanced compounds, possibly for predicting human doses or to optimize formulations where you can carefully tune the calculations for each compound. You probably have uh, some in vitro experimental data to use in the inputs, uh, and you'll fill in the rest with the global QSARs. And GastroPlus also includes local sensitivity analysis, where the inputs can be varied one at a time over a very small range. That's a feature of the program. On the other extreme, there have been some published studies, Mike showed a few, where uh, they've done uh, taken large numbers of drug compounds and applied PVPK calculations 
using purely global QSARs as the inputs. Uh, but uh, we're to help in lead optimization, we think we have to have most of the calculations to be within a factor of two. And when you look at broad ranges of compounds, uh, usually the global QSARs aren't reliable enough to, to achieve that accuracy. But lead optimization is kind of an intermediate case. Here, we tune the program not for individual molecules, but for the entire lead series. All of the inputs do have to be calculated from structure, but we have the advantage that we can train local QSAR models that are specific to that lead series, and that's often better than a global QSAR model. The other difference is that we want to do global sensitivity analysis, where we vary all of the important inputs over the entire range that we think is accessible to active members of this MedChem series, and vary all of them in com all combinations so that we can optimize the bioavailability globally. So this illustrates our entire process. Uh, we start with the global QSARs to calculate the inputs to Gastro Plus, and we uh, then run that on maybe 15 or more uh, uh, compounds for which we have rat bioavailability data, and compare the predictions to the experimental values. And if they don't agree, which they usually don't using global QSARs uh, uh, reliably enough, then we go back and uh, we build some local QSAR models and repeat this process until we get a good correspondence. Having done that, we can then go on to the next step, which is to run thousands of simulations for all these different combinations of the input properties. Then we fit that with partial least squares regression to a quadratic function. And the coefficients from that fit are the sensitivities uh, over the entire series um, for each of the input properties, which are the important properties. Having this PLS function also now has gone from a, a discrete bioavailability landscape to a continuous landscape where we can sit on individual compounds and in the important uh, sensitive dimensions of this hypercube, we can look at the bioavailability landscape and see which ways would we go if we wanted to analog from that particular compound. So we developed and tested this on three MedChem series, uh, the, a DPP-4 series from published by Merck, an HSD-1 series published by AstraZeneca, and a uh, PIM series that's internal to Novartis. And starting in all cases, the, the biggest challenge was the clearance input. And I'll explain how we've solved that with a local QSAR for an apparent fitted liver clearance. Again, our goal is an average error of less than two of less than twofold. With the DPP4 series, we first tried using their published in vivo plasma clearance, and that worked uh, very poorly. The majority of compounds were grossly underpicked predicted, uh, two thirds of them, and the average error was 17 and a half fold. So just using the published plasma clearance was a, a failure. They did not publish any in vitro intrinsic clearance. So we built a global QSAR using Novartis data for rat liver microsome zones uh, based on 6,600 experimental values. And that worked better. Uh, the, um, the average error was two and a half fold, but only 43% were within, the, within this two fold error that we're looking for. So not, not that good. So we took a different tact. The first thing we did was use the optimization capability of Gastro Plus to find a liver clearance, the fitted liver clearance that exactly reproduced the experimental bioavailability. So the points lie exactly on the line. We then built a local QSAR for the DPP4 uh, series and used those predicted values from that local QSAR for fitted liver clearance as the input. And then the results were, were quite good. The average error was 1.7 fold, and now 86% were, were within our envelope of twofold error, and um, there were no really terrible outliers. With the HSD1 series, the results were quite different. Here, using the published plasma clearance, it actually worked pretty well. Uh, the average error was twofold, three quarters were within our factor of two there were still some pretty bad outliers. They had also published uh, 
in vitro hepatocyte clearance. And in this case, uh, the average error again was twofold, and it got rid of those worst over predictions. When we tried, in this case, using our global intrinsic clearance model from rat liver microsomes, the results were not good. The average error was three and a half fold and only 20% were within two fold. So together, we took, I, I interpreted these as saying that, that liver clearance is important, what's important because we are assigning all the clearance in this case to the liver, but uh, it's not just uh, phase one metabolism. It might include phase two metabolism or hepatic uptake, which is very consistent with the graph that uh, the ECCS analysis that, that Mike just showed us, suggesting that a lot of these compounds uh, do uh, have hepatic uptake as a, a mechanism of elimination. When we then used our the method I previously described, this local QSAR for a fitted um, ideal liver clearance, the uh, the results were very good. The average error was 1.6 fold and 80% were within the factor of two. With the PIM series, again, like the DPP4, in this case, the using the plasma clearance, pub, uh, uh, this is now internal, not published, uh, the, a lot of the compounds were under predicted and the results uh, were, not, were not very good. Being an internal project, we had a lot more experimental data. So we had rat liver microsomal clearance, uh, solubility, log D, PKA. So when we ran the calculations with whatever experimental data were available, filling in the rest with the gastro plus global QSARs, uh, we got okay results. Uh, two thirds were within our factor, but there were a, a number that were over predicted and the average was, was higher than we were hoping for. Interestingly, in this case, if we used entirely the global QSARs, we did better than when we included the available experimental in vitro data. So now the error is down where we're looking for it at twofold and two thirds are, are within, within our envelope. Uh, when we used our local QSAR for the uh, fitted apparent liver clearance, we got really good results with the average error of 1.4 fold uh, and really nothing even threefold. Um, uh, wrong. But we kind of cheated. Uh, we did this using, at the ends of these studies, retrospectively, and we used all the available bioavailability data, except that we had held out test sets, of course. So then we asked, well, how early could we get involved in the project and still have this be useful? So for the PIM study, the internal study, we actually had the synthesis dates, and we could do a chronological analysis. Uh, so we trained these models on the first 18 compounds that had been synthesized. Um, of course, there's also a held out test set, so they're not all training the model. And it did pretty well. The average error was 2.1 fold, and uh, most of the compounds, two thirds, were within within our window. There was, however, a set that were over predicted. Uh, we then took a later date where we were now had a total of 37 compounds. And now this worked quite successfully. Two of those uh, compounds we used to train the model were from this cluster and that brought the whole group back down to the line and now we have one and a half fold error and 80% are within our envelope. Uh, we then took an even later date so we could use more data but, uh, and, and that did improve the model but, but only incrementally. Now for the, the published cases, uh, DPP4 and HSD1, we didn't have the publication, the uh, synthesis dates, but they had both been assembled from a number of different publications. So we used the publication submission date as a, as a surrogate for the order in which the compounds had been synthesized. And this slide summarizes the results for all three of those sets, um, <coughs> which went from 48 to 81 compounds. Uh, the first column here is the results you've already seen for using our global rat liver microsome uh, model as the source of clearance. And as I mentioned, the results are mixed. Uh, probably not good enough that you would expect to use them for lead optimization, but possibly good enough that you could use them to, to uh, uh, decide from a hit list from screening which are the compounds which, if you took it into lead optimization, 
uh, would be fairly bioavailable, bioavailable or which were the compounds if you started a series that bioavailability would be a real uphill battle. By the time we had from 15 to 18 compounds, uh, the results are looking pretty good, probably for the most part good enough that they could start to inform lead optimization. Uh, by the time it was from 30 to 37 compounds, uh, then the results are looking very good. And again, in all cases, going to even more compounds did improve the results, but, but only incrementally. So in all three cases, by using this local QSAR for the fitted apparent liver clearance, we were able to achieve our goal of getting accuracy sufficient for lead optimization. So now it was time to move on to the next task of performing thousands of simulations to get a discrete bioavailability landscape, then fitting that using partial least squares regression to make a, a continuous function and from which we could either plot bioavailability landscapes or and also look at the sensitivities of the compound properties. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, issues we had to deal with in order to uh, apply global sensitivity analysis to a chemical problem. Uh, some of them routine, some of them uh, novel and challenging. One of the routine problems is that many of the input properties are not properly distributed in their familiar units, and so we had to do log transforms. And uh, in all the cases, we z-scaled the properties so that they'd be in units of standard deviations and could be comparably compared uh, in the analysis. A more difficult problem was the uh, fact that drugs can have anywhere from zero to half a dozen or more ionizable groups. So how do you line them up in order to define a property space for the sensitivity analysis, and how would you explain something that complicated if they turn out to be important to the medicinal chemists? But what we discovered was that only two of the PKAs matter, the one immediately above and immediately below the isoelectric point. So here for the cephalos cephalosporin analog that has seven PKAs, uh, we have the pH solubility curves using all of those seven PKAs or just using those two. And they're not identical, but they're really very close. And here now for a set of, of over 2,000 compounds, uh, plotted the results using all the PKAs or just using the two that straddle the isoelectric point, And the correlation is excellent, R squared of 0.99 and an RMSE of 0 0.06. And so that problem was essentially solved. Uh, an even more difficult problem was the fact that in chemical problems, there are gonna be combinations of inputs which are incompatible with each other. For example, you can't have a compound that's extremely water soluble and also extremely lipophilic. And so we have to remove those impossible combinations from the analysis because they won't correspond to real compounds. To solve that problem, we started with the zinc database, which at the time had 16 and a half million drug-like compounds. It's a public domain database. Uh, calculated all of the input properties for Gastro Plus, and that gave us essentially a cloud in property space representing the chemically compatible combinations of properties. Uh, we then filtered that by the ranges we thought were uh, accessible to our MedChem series, and in, in all cases, that dropped it down to around 3 million compounds, clipped off the ones that are outside that range. Uh, then we performed principal components analysis to reduce the dimensionality, and then sampled that on a grid of five or six levels to reduce it down to about 10,000 compounds. This was a number for which we could run the Gastro Plus simulations to get the discrete property uh, bioavailability landscape and then fit that with partially squares regression to do the sensitivity analysis. And so in order to trust these coefficients, we had to know that that uh, PLS fit was a good approximation of the full simulations, and indeed it was. Uh, we built the quadratic PLS model using these eight properties that we thought would be most important for the medicinal chemists. And uh, looking at the five-fold uh, cross-validated correlation between prediction and experiment that's leaving out 20, each set of 20% and predicting it on models built with the, re all, the remaining sets of 80%. For PIM, that was a correlation of 0 0.92, and for HSD1 and DPP4, 0 0.98. So those were very good fits. Uh, to sort of put that in perspective, 
uh, looking at the PIM case, which was the worst fit, uh, compared, we compared the full gastro plus simulations to the PLS uh, approximation using the three different kinds of computational uh, clearance that we're using. The first being the the apparent, the uh, fitted apparent uh, liver clearance. And that, of course, lies exactly on the line because that's how it's defined. And the small scatter that you see from using the PLS uh, approximation is all due to the, the small error in the PLS fit. Uh, this is using the local QSAR for the uh, apparent liver clearance. And you know, if you look at these two graphs, you have to look really closely to show, convince yourself that they're not really identical. And likewise, using the global rat liver microsome clearance uh, QSAR, the two graphs, they look virtually the same. Uh, and so this shows that substituting the PLS quadratic equation for the full simulation for the PIM lead series doesn't introduce any meaningful additional error over doing the full simulation which most importantly means we can trust the coefficients that come out of the modeling. So we looked at the three different cases. In, in all three cases, in this case, uh, these three cases, intrinsic clearance turned out to be the most important property, which we scale to plus or minus one. And then these blue dashed lines indicate 25% uh, of the importance of the most important property, and that's where we've decided to call a, a cutoff for what we're going to consider a sensitive property. And so starting with HSD1 here, the only important property turns out to be the intrinsic clearance. Uh, notably, log P is not important, and one way to reduce intrinsic clearance is to make compounds more polar. After all, that's what, that's what uh, uh, oxidative metabolism is for, is to make compounds more polar. And so the message to the medicinal chemists I would give here would be all you have to worry about is clearance in order to improve your bioavailability. In particular, if you want to, you can make your compounds more polar without worrying about that hurting the permeability because in this case, log P is not an important, uh, not a sensitive coefficient and you can change that a lot before it'll start to have any influence. However, in both the PIM kinase and the DPP4 cases, the log P and also the blood to plasma ratio are also sensitive properties. And so here, the message to the chemists would be, you can't use that simple ploy of making the compounds more polar. You're gonna to have to identify the metabolites and use medicinal chemistry to block metabolism. Uh, in PIM kinase, one additional property, the effective intestinal permeability was also important. We don't have experimental data to compare it to, but we can also use the simulations to look at the fraction absorbed. In this case now, intrinsic clearance is not important because we're only looking at liver clearance. We didn't assign any clearance to the gut. And in all three cases, log P and effective intestinal permeability now are important properties for the absorption in the portal vein. Uh, in two of the cases, PIM and HSD1, the solubility, is also an important property. It's not for DPP4. Those compounds are all sufficiently soluble. In that case, however, there is a, an important contribution from the PKA that's above, immediately above the isoelectric point. In HSD1, that's not important, but the PKA immediately below the isoelectric point is, as well as the fraction unbound in plasma. We also wanted to assure ourselves that the, what we were looking at was really due to uh, the data, not due to the particular way we happen to be analyzing it or the particular compounds that we chose. And so one thing we did was a thousand steps of bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is taking different subsets of the compounds and repeating the analysis. These, what look like fuzzy vertical lines, these are actually box plots showing the variation in the coefficients due to taking different subsets of the data. And uh, so the fact that you can't even tell that they're box, box plots, I think, shows that the coefficients are very stable, that we are always going to get the same answer no matter which compounds we choose. Also, besides doing partially squares regression to fit the model to get the coefficients on a six-level grid, we also did it on a five-level grid. And we also used a completely different statistical method, in this case, an art artificial neural network. 
and did the same analysis. And in all three cases, while the results aren't identical uh, from method to method, they're close enough that the, the message to the medicinal chemists would be essentially the same. And so it's not dependent on the degree of sampling that we've done, we've done sufficient, and it's not degree de dependent on the particular statistical method that we've chosen to analyze the data. So we think this really is what the data themselves are telling us. And finally, as I had mentioned before, we can look at slices through the sensitive properties. Here for the PIM case, it's looking at the log P versus uh, effective intestinal permeability slices around particular compounds that you might want to analyze. So for this compound, it's saying that, well, both of those are important for the series overall. For this compound, you would get more of an improvement by raising log P than by trying to change the intestinal permeability. Uh, here's a compound where the uh, intestinal permeability is a sensitive, the more sensitive property, and here's a compound uh, for which you'd really uh, do best to, to modify both. So this was great. We felt really positive. We were getting good results that we were hoping to get. And then the first real case where we tried to apply it, it turned out that these compounds were subject to PGP efflux, and uh, the method we'd used was not, was not turning out to be very effective because we weren't taking that into account. Now, Gastro Plus can take PGP efflux into account, but what it wants as inputs are the Michaelis-Menten parameters. Uh, and in lead optimization, you're never gonna have those. The thing we do have are KCO2 efflux ratios. And so <clears throat> we tried to use the KCO2 e to efflux ratios by a similar mechanism, by a similar approach to what we'd used before to convert those to, uh, to Vmax. So we chose a compound which was strong. So this is the uh, prediction versus experiment and the compounds if we ignore efflux using the experimental microsomal intrinsic clearance are all way over predicted because they're ignoring the, eff the uh, efflux. We took a compound that was strongly effluxed and not very fast intrinsic clearance in, in microsomes. And then we use the optimization module to get the value of the max that would exactly reproduce the experimental bioavailability, bring it back down onto the line. And we set that as one point for making a conversion between efflux ratio, B to A over A to B, KCO2 efflux ratio and V max. We then also systematically lowered the Vmax down until it stopped making any real difference in the bioavailability calculation, and we used that as a lower limit. <coughs> Excuse me. And then just drew a straight line to uh, a calibration curve to convert efflux ratios to Vmax. We then uh, used our method, use that value of Vmax in the calculations and used our method that we'd used before of building a local QSAR for the optimized uh, apparent liver clearance. And that worked great. Almost all the compounds were within our two-fold window. Unfortunately, at this point, it still requires an experimental KCO2 efflux ratio. So it's not yet applicable to compounds that are yet to be synthesized. Uh, but then we built first a global QSAR model for KCO2 clearance or efflux ratio, and and then uh, built a local uh, adjustment to that global model for this particular lead series. Use that to get the V max values with our calibration curve, and then used those results with the local QSAR for intrinsic clearance. So now all the inputs are purely computational, and we're still getting almost all the compounds within the two-fold window. In this case, then, when we look at what are the important coefficients, uh, intrinsic clearance is still important, as is intestinal permeability for this case, but also efflux is almost as important as those two. We also then went back and reanalyzed the PIM data set because there was some uh, G, uh, PGP efflux for those compounds, which we had ignored in the original analysis. And when we did that, we did find that indeed uh, PGP efflux was a, uh, a sensitive parameter, although not a highly sensitive parameter. Now this linear combination, it, it's, it's adequate, but 
it's not uh, uh, it's simplistic and gas uh, simulations plus now has a, a another program membrane plus which is specifically for simulating keiko 2 uh, permeability experiments and so what we're currently working on is tr as a uh, next generation is to use those simulations of the keiko 2 experiment and optimize the vmax to reproduce the efflux ratio b to a over ab and then build a local QSAR on that optimized ideal version of Vmax. This should be better than that simple linear uh, calibration. And then we would use that Vmax value with our usual uh, approach of making a local QSAR for liver clearance uh, to uh, be able to then uh, do the global sensitivity analysis. So now that we have this uh, PLS equation, which is a very rapid way to calculate bioavailability that for a given lead series is, is a very good approximation of the full gastro plus simulation, uh, we oh, are now applying that to structure-based drug design. And so uh, Ben has incorporated the PLS equation into the ICM molecular modeling package. This shows its interactive mode where you modify the 3D structure of the of the drug candidate inside the active site of the protein. The uh, docking pr uh, score gives a prediction of the affinity of the ligand for the protein. The uh, PLS approximation of the bioavailability calculation gives an estimate of the bioavailability. And then the two, in this case, were just combined as an average to get a, a combined score optimizing, uh, considering the value of, of both of those to try and design compounds in the active site that are both have good affinity and also good bioavailability. Or alternatively, with ICM, you can enumerate large uh, virtual libraries by try putting on all different combinations of side chains then the program will go through and dock all of those compounds to estimate their affinity. And the script will go through and calculate the estimated bioavailability. And again, the, the combined uh, multi-parameter score. So you can then sort by that score and that will bring the most interesting compounds to the top of the list for, for further evaluation. So when I show this to medicinal chemists, they think that's great. Now we can estimate bioavailability and use that in our designs. But when I show it to, to uh, PK scientists, they say, well, bioavailability is all well and good, but it's not exposure. What we really want is exposure. So we've just started looking at that. Uh, this is, again, the, the PIM, going back to the PIM case. Uh, here are results uh, where we're trying now to optimize simultaneously on bioavailability and area under the curve. And this shows the results for bioavailability. They look quite good. This shows the results for AUC. Uh, they're not as good. You can see they're different scales. So a lot of these are slightly over predicted, but the correlation is certainly there and we consider that a promising, a promising start. This is uh, midway through, I think a very ambitious ultimate aim, which is to do structure-based design, not just of affinity of the ligand for the protein, but of in vivo efficacy. And I think we've got a lot of the pieces now in place. To use the simulations and our way of optimizing them, of adapting them to a particular lead series to calculate things like AUC or Cmax measures of exposure. Use the docking methods that have been used by medicinal chemists, by a computational chemists for many years to predict the affinity of the ligand for the protein to get the EC50. And then the, the final step is to use an empirical PK-PD relationship in Gastro Plus to, uh, to get the uh, predicted uh, efficacy from the, the EC50 from the structure-based drug design and the tissue-specific exposure in index uh, 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 measure from the, the, these uh, Gastro Plus customized calculations. So that's, that's where we uh, hope eventually to go. So in conclusion, uh, we have, I think, successfully adapted PP, VPK simulations to specific lead series. 
the problem of clearance was solved with an apparent the local QSAR for an apparent liver clearance. The requirement is 15 to 18 rat bioavailabilities to train that, uh, which um, we're hoping can be done with just three cassettes of six compounds each. So that would not at all be an onerous, an onerous requirement. In all three cases that we studied, we were able to get the average error less than twofold. Actually, now I showed you four cases. Um, the global sensitivity analysis did find the influential compound properties that required solving the problem of the many PKAs, which we solved by observing that only the two straddling the isoelectric point really matter. Uh, and the incompatible combinations of properties was solved by only sampling regions of property space that were covered by the zinc database. And we ended up with unique adv advice for each series uh, that for HSD1, only the intrinsic clearance, the uh, liver clearance was important. For DPP4, uh, log P and blood to plasma ratio also uh, were significant, and for PIM, uh, those three as well as effective permeability. I think we're making good progress uh, in PGP efflux using just a simple linear calibration, uh, and we're hoping to do better by incorporating the membrane plus calculations by optimizing Vmax against directly against KCO2 efflux ratios. The PLS models turn out to be a very good approximation for the full simulations within a MedChem series. Uh, they're insensitive to the details of the specific compounds used, the sampling density, or the statistical method employed. The coefficients do give the property simulations. Uh, we can use them to make contour plots to visualize the bioavailability landscape around particular compounds in detail. And they also give a quick but apt accurate estimate of bioavailability to use in structure-based uh, bioavailability design. The initial results of area under the curve are promising, and our ultimate goal is the structure-based design of in vivo efficacy. So uh, the principal people who uh, contributed to this, uh, of course, were Pankaj Daga, the uh, uh, original postdoc who worked on this problem, who developed the PBPK and GSA basic method for MedChem series. Ben Made, who is my current postdoc, who has been adding the PGP analysis, the area under the curve calculations, um, and also adding the combining the the bioavailability estimate from PBPK with uh, structure-based drug design in the ICM package. Mike, who's been a constant coworker. Uh, co-inventor on all of this and was the external mentor to both Ben and to Pankaj, and Bob Clark, who probably many of you know, who's an outstanding biostatistician who works with Mike at Simulation Plus. Uh, most of these results were recently published in the, the ACS Journal of uh, Molecular Pharmaceutics. So with that, uh, I think both Mike and I are ready to uh, listen to your questions or comments or criticisms or whatever. Thank you, Eric and Mike, for, for um, the great presentation. Um, at this point, we will open up for questions. Um, I saw there are several questions came up already. Um, the first the question, I think this is a topic to uh, simulation class. Is the clear, a clearance mechanism model now available in admin predictor? Uh, and this is Mike. Uh, the um, human clearance um, binary classification mechanism model um, will be available in AdMet Predictor 9.0. Um, the 8.5 version did not have this, but um, there may also be some other um, options. Uh, the final set of ECCS-like uh, calculations is to be determined, but uh, there will be definitely a lot of um, choices on that. Thank you. The next question, um, this is to Eric. In your example of estimating clearance in with DPP R11 beta HSD1 program, you had developed a model using 48 or 81 compounds. Have you used this model to test in new molecules? And what was the prediction accuracy? 
No, at this point, we have only done this retrospectively or with the uh, pseudo chronological prospective study with the PIM case for well, and the other cases where we where we had the uh, estimates of the order in which the compounds have been made. Um, we haven't, this is, this is new enough that we haven't yet applied it to a real ongoing project. Uh, as I mentioned, the one, when we were about to do that, uh, we ran into this PGP uh, efflux issue, uh, which we had to solve. And so now hopefully we're in a position to, uh, to move forward with actual application to a, a project. Thank you. The next question. Uh, for your in vivo prediction, is there any difference between species? That is between prediction for rats, but not the or better prediction for rats, but not for dogs, etc. Et so I have only looked at rat. Um, maybe Mike can comment more generally about how the models, how Gastro Plus performs using different species. Well, it's a good question, and. Um, I, you know, there's a link here between ADMET predictors HTPK results and GastroPlus. So I think most of the audience is familiar with using GastroPlus to um, do models with preclinical species and do scale up to human, where the uh, preclinical species help to inform your first in human predictions. But as far as the either purely in silico or in silico enhanced with the um, fitted local clearance model. I don't think we have enough information yet to say um, how that would work between species. Um, I, I hope that answers the, uh, the question. But in ADMED predictor, the HTPK does um, have parameters for both human and rat um, liver microsomes for the clearance model and uh, fraction unbound and blood plaza concentration ratio. Thank you. Um, anyone on the phone, you can raise your hand. Uh, I'm just going through, okay, there's one more here. For PGP only, VMAX is considered for scaling. In reality, it is the VMAX slash KM that drives the efflux Clearance. Any thoughts? Yeah, we we only are fitting on bioavailability, so we can only optimize one parameter. And uh, actually, it's, it's Mike. It was Mike's intuition that uh, of the two parameters, Vmax was most important. So we pick a typical value of KM, fix that, and just to, just adjust the Vmax. Uh, one thought is that now that we're starting to look at additional. Uh, output parameters like area under the curve or Cmax that we then uh, in that case would have the option of fitting more than one input to the gastro plus calculations so we could try to do the optimization there or we could try fitting the A to B and the B to A uh, separately in the KCO2 calculations to fit two parameters although I think those probably um, are too tightly coupled that we really wouldn't have two independent pieces of data. So uh, the, the, uh, the data, I, I think, is probably less, less promising. I can make a comment also about um, the efflux transporters and KM. Um, it takes a lot of data for um, in vitro data for you to establish the intracellular unbound KMs that would be used in Gastro Plus that are accurate to reproduce nonlinear dose dependence. We've published some papers in this area for uh, pure PGP substrates and also for substrates that are, um, uh, you know, substrates of PGP and 3A4. And the uh, significance of the KM is very high for escalating uh, doses, but uh, it is a little bit uh, tricky to you know, get for a congeneric series, a good estimate of KM that could be used in this case. So for the work that um, Eric and Ben are doing now, uh, we have settled on a uh, fixed KM that is um, not necessarily subject to uh, saturability. 
Thank you. Uh, Neil, Neil Perak, you, um, you have a question? You can go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I, I think you asked my question already, Sherlyn. Okay. All right, um, let's see. Uh, there's one last question here. How well do the PK modeling in rats translate to CPK and admin studies in human clinical trials? So for the, the t work that I talked about for the lead series, um, we don't have any any results to to test that, and so we don't know whether our way of assigning all of the clearance to the liver is going to uh, degrade the ability to extrapolate to uh, to human. Um, and as for the general ability to extrapolate from rat to human under a conventional way of using gastro plus, Mike best could speak to that. Yeah, I would say that our experience is that. If you are going to try to do um, dose estimations for first in human or um, predict the uh, exposure in humans, that building the models in rat or dog um, is a very good step. A PBPK model in rat and dog, particularly with uh, intravenous data, helps you to establish the assumptions needed to uh, get a good mechanistic calculation of volume at steady state and it also gives you an idea if the metabolic clearance from microsomes represents the full um, systemic clearance or whether there's some extra hepatic clearance so the early modeling in preclinical species is very valuable to uh, develop those assumptions for your first in human predictions Thank you. Um, let's see. One more question here. For many projects, the mouse is more important than rat. Are you at the simulation process developing in silico models also for mouse? Uh, the answer on that one is absolutely yes. We've had um, both gut um, physiology for mouse and uh, whole body PBPK uh, physiology for mouse. We have uh, developed a biological therapeutics module in Gastro Plus for monoclonal antibodies that um, almost all of our validation work has been in mouse. Um, and that's both um, mice with knockout uh, FCRN and also m mice with um, xenobiotic uh, tumors. So uh, there's quite a bit that we've done with m mouse. Very good. And um, I don't mean xenobiotic. I mean xen xenograft tumors. Sorry about that. I knew I had flubbed that. Go ahead, Sherlyn. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's the end of the, uh, the question list so far. And um, there's one question regarding uh, whether the slides will be available. Um, um, we will follow up with the speakers on the availability of the slides. But uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, this webinar, I believe, has been recorded, and then it will be available on the website of the Simulation Plus, and then they are available to the user group members. Um, I see that we, re we now reach the end of uh, time for the webinar. We also addressed all the questions so far posted. Um, so now, in case um, if the audience, if you have additional questions after the webinar, um, please go to our Gastro Plus user group linked in uh, website where you can post your questions. Your questions will be addressed by our members or the members in Simulations Plus. So thank you again, Mike and Eric, for the presentation and answering all the questions. For the audience, thank you all for your participation. You may now disconnect from the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sherlyn and Eric. Thank you. Thank you.